Okay, looking good, looking good. Okay, I want to start here um, with the role of microbes in eukaryotic evolution. And what I'm showing here is a, is a phylogenetic tree that shows the evolutionary relationships among the three major domains of life, which of course include bacteria, eukaryotes, and archaea. What's, what I want to point out in this particular tree is that bacteria and archaea, as Sarah mentioned, have been on the planet for much longer than eukaryotes have. So they evolved 3.8, bacteria evolved 3.8 billion years ago. Bacteria evolved before archaea. Um, about a billion years ago is when animals started to arise. And what I'd like to note is that most of the diversity in this tree is in fact microbial. So if you're looking at evolution from a genetic diversity perspective, virtually all of the major uh, lineages of life are either in the bac bacteria, archaea, or in eukaryotes such as protists. There's a small group of eukaryotic organisms at this end of the tree, and that comprise everything that we can see, which would include uh, our cells and macroscopic uh, animals and plants as well. And so most of life that we can see evolved in a soup of microorganisms. But before these taxa that we're very commonly familiar with arose, life was dominated by microbes. And when these taxa arose, this small fraction of the tree, they evolved in this soup of microorganisms. So it's inherent that eukaryotes and the kinds of eukaryotes were recognized by I evolved with microorganisms since they arose. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that organisms like ourselves and uh, invertebrates and down through the chain of order have been faced with challenges of dealing with microbes either as parasites but also developing long-term relationships that have led to beneficial or mutualistic interactions with microorganisms. Microorganisms will live on this planet far longer than uh, the macroscopic organisms that we know of. And we can't live without the microorganisms. Now, that's how important uh, microorganisms have been to the uh, eukaryotic evolution. Now, of course, the other major thing to note is that organelles like chloroplasts and mitochondria are examples of long-term associations in which bacteria snuggled up inside a eukaryotic cell and remained in that cell for so long that they ultimately became an organelle. Here's some of the major evolutionary innovations that have occurred through animal bacteria symbioses, and specifically endosymbioses, which is what I'm going to focus the rest of this talk on. Endosymbioses just means living inside. So one of the two, the bacteria lives inside the animal host, and that's called an endosymbiotic event. Here's three examples that are probably well known to you. Um, the eukaryotic cell was presumably arisen from the fusion of an archaea and a bacteria, two single-celled organisms that ultimately gave rise to a complex eukaryotic cell. And so this chart, this graph on the right here, shows an image of how this ring of life occurred between archaea and bacteria that ultimately gave rise to the first eukaryotes. Second, as I was just mentioning, eukaryotic organelles such as chloroplasts and mitochondria, were once anciently derived bacteria that became organelles. Chloroplasts arose from a group of bacteria called cyanobacteria, and mitochondria arose from a group of bacteria called the alpha proteobacteria. And finally, there are many cases where eukaryotic organisms could not exist in their environment without the nutrients provided by their bacterial symbionts. So we exploit all kinds of nutrient-limited niches. Without, without those microbes, those niches cannot be exploited by eukaryotes. All right. So let's talk one second about how important symbiosis is to ourselves, to the human body. Most of this talk won't focus on humans, but let's use this as a starting point to, to drill down into more interesting topics. So here's a question that we'd like you to stamp your answer on. And the question is, what percent of the cells in your body are human? And the, uh, the, this is the, what percent of your cells in your body are human as opposed to what percent of the cells in your body are microbial. So if everybody could just stamp their answer. Okay. 
And it looks like a spread there, Seth. It would be interesting to find out what the answer is. Yeah, well, um, it's looking really great. Everybody got, uh, well, most people got, I'd say, half right. And so the, the trend is to estimate towards the lower end of the range. And in fact, that's where the answer lies. The real answer is 10%, which is um, only a small fraction of people actually got. This is, this is actually a new number that uh, scientists are dealing with, that only 10% of the cells in your body are, in fact, human. The rest of them are micro microorganisms. And so in the big scheme of things, we're just a walking bag of microorganisms. And that's how important symbiosis is to ourselves. So if 90% of the cells in your body, on your skin, in your organs, in your mouth, are microbial, the question becomes, what are those, and how important are they are to your health and to disease? and to diseases. And there's a new initiative by the National Institute of Health called the Human Microbiome. It might be analogous to the Human Genome Project 10 years ago, where now the human microbiome is going to be mapped by DNA sequencers to figure out what exactly are all these different microorganisms doing in our body. Uh, one way to think about this is that there are more bacteria in your mouth than there are people on the planet, um, which is just an astounding number. Okay. It's difficult to study a complex system where 90% of the cells in the body are, in fact, microbial. And I want to move on to insects, because insects are an excellent model system to study what can be complex relationships between a single bacteria and a single host, rather than dealing with all these complexities of so many different microorganisms. Here's why insects are excellent model systems to study symbiosis with. And this is sort of a lead-in for what we're going to be talking about, which is a discovery-based lab project that you can bring into your classroom that focuses on bringing insects and looking at symbionts inside insects. Insects have been present on the planet for 350 million years. So they're old and ancient and have had a lot of time to be the most successful animal on the planet. So insects comprise 85% of all animal species. So when you think of the animal world, the reality is that insects rule the animal world, and we're just a small piece of that story. There's an estimated 1 million insect species, and there's an, unest there's a, there's an estimate that there may be as many as 30 million insect species that exist on the planet. And 20% of all the insect species that we know of harbor a bacteria called Wolbachia. And Wolbachia is what I'm going to spend uh, much of the rest of this talk on. Here's the neat thing. If you were to extrapolate that there are 20% of all insect species harbor Wolbachia, and that there may be 30 million different insect species on the planet, then 6 million insect species are estimated to be infected with this bacterial symbiont called Wolbachia. The challenge for us is that how do we discover all these different cases when there's only one or 200 Wolbachia scientists in the world? And I'll tell you why it's important to survey for Wolbachia, but the big question becomes, can we get some extra help in our efforts to understand this very widespread symbiosis? Wolbachia could be one of the most, could be the most widespread bacterial symbiont on the planet because it's so widespread in insect species. So ultimately, we believe that you, as teachers and your classes, can become our biggest asset to scientific discovery of how common Wolbachia are in your own backyards, in the schoolyard, from the homes. A whole nationwide sampling could take place in which students and you can become part of a nationwide research project to survey the frequency of Wolbachia in insect fauna. Um, our interest is, has been primarily in ninth to 12th grade classrooms that can take on some of this uh, biotechnology. We've also seen this project go on at the seventh grade level. So it's good that we've got a good, a good spectrum of teachers across the board uh, to hear about this. If there are any questions along the way, um, feel free to type in the text box, and I'll be happy to answer those. Oh, do we have a question now? OK, I don't see anything yet. So let's move on. Well, Seth, actually, um, Cheryl's got a question here. Uh, would that be a good research project like to complete a master's program or just for kids? Yeah, in fact, this research is done, is, is based on a replica of what I do in my lab, um, or my technician does really in my lab, every week or every month. 
So uh, the kind of research we're presenting to you is stuff that the Wolbachia community works on, but also that we want you to become part of. And we're not trying to distinguish between what level of research this is. This is top tier research. Um, and the potential for new discoveries of different Wolbachia strains and new insect species is as important to scientists as it is to the classroom. But anywhere um, that this can be made possible is what we're interested in. We don't want to necessarily set up any criteria for um, who can do this. This is for teachers, but this is really for students to become part of the scientific process. Ultimately, we want to make doers and lovers of science rather than just be taught scientific facts. And I think that we all probably appreciate that. I'm going to move on. And if there isn't another question, uh, Seth, we've we've got um, both Sarah and I are talking at the same time, but <laughs> um, there's just a number of questions about how to get involved, and I think you're really going to speak to that. So let's have uh, Seth go on and and just sort of talk about this process, and then we can get into more detail about how students and teachers can get involved. So go ahead, Seth. Okay, great. Um, thanks. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so here's here's the title of the project. And if you were to do a Google search, but you don't have to do that right now, but if this is the one thing that sticks, remember, discover the microbes within the Wolbachia project. And that's the title of our program. It's sponsored by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute um, as part of their pre-college science education program. This picture shown here is an embryo of an insect. It's actually a wasp embryo that I study in my lab. And this embryo is stained with two different colors. One is blue for insect DNA. And the other is green for the Wolbachia DNA. And as you can see, these insect chromosomes, these little tiny blue dots, are dividing as the embryo is, is developing. But on the left side of that embryo, there's a, there's a lot of bright green dots that represent the Wolbachia symbionts. And these are symbionts that are inherited maternally from the mother to the offspring, directly into the eggs every generation. So instead of a microorganism being acquired from the environment, this Wolbachia symbiont lives inside insects, in fact, lives inside their reproductive tissues. And as new eggs are being created in the reproductive tissues, the bacteria are secreted into the developing eggs. And what we're looking here is a freshly laid embryo in which we can see this new set of bacteria that's populating the embryo from the mothers. Um, let's move on. And before I get into telling you what is the function of this symbiont, which is really fascinating, and I'm going to sort of hold that off for a second, let's talk about uh, what are the general phenomena that result um, from symbiosis. And I'll give you the definitions of these before you answer. So which of the following occurs as a result of symbiosis? Parasitism is when one partner in the symbiosis harms the other partner. Usually the, the parasite harms the host. Mutualism is when one partner benefits, or maybe both partner benefits, in the association between these two organisms. And commensalism is when I, I, no partner either benefits or harms each other. So there's really no functional effect. They just live together. Um, and the final answer is all of the above. So could everybody, uh, actually I think Rob will take it from here and do this poll quiz to answer this question. OK. I've got the poll button up there, and um, I was—I uh, didn't get this one right, so <laughs> not that that's any great consequence of anything like that. But go ahead and put your answer in. I'll be curious to see if you get it right. So we'll give you a few more seconds. Going once, going twice. Looks like we've got most people answering already. Susan Hurst Calderon has joined us. She is often been a uh, moderator, a volunteer moderator. Welcome, Susan. We're glad that you're here uh, in today. I'm going to lock the results. And uh, let's see what we got. I'm going to put the original question on here. So just bear with me one second. Oops. That's not the right one. I don't think I captured this one, Seth. So um, my apologies okay. for that. Let's see if, nope, I didn't get it. So. Um, it looks like, although it doesn't seem very difficult to ascertain, that most people had said D, so I'll put it back on there. Go ahead. Yeah, so the correct answer is D, all of the above. And the reason I asked that question is because historically symbiosis has been defined as mutualism, where one partner benefits the other. But in fact, 
when it was originally proposed in 1859, symbiosis was defined as the living together of dissimilar organisms. And there's been a sort of a, a, a renaissance to recover that original definition. But symbiosis can be parasitism, mutualism, commensalism, all of these three phenomena. So when we say symbiont, it doesn't necessarily mean a mutualist or a parasite. OK, with that introduction into symbiosis, let's talk about what Wolbachia actually is. And so in the insect world, Wolbachia could be uh, sort of in a fun way called infectious widowmakers. And they are parasitic to their insect hosts. And Wolbachia, as I mentioned, are transmitted maternally from the mother to the offspring each generation. So Wolbachia is very interested in creating more females in the population because that's the transmitting sex of this microorganism. Males are a dead end. So if a Wolbachia bacteria could make more females, then they're essentially making more of the sex that can transmit them, and therefore Wolbachia could spread themselves through the population. Um, here are three of the phenotypes that Wolbachia cause. So male killing is what it sounds like. Um, male embryos are killed when they're laid, and female embryos live on and develop normally. So you can have a population of infected flies. These are Drosophila mushroom-feeding flies. And they, these females will lay a batch of offspring. But all their male offspring that are infected will die due to some toxin that the bacteria puts into the embryo. But the female embryos will develop and live on. Uh, parthenogenesis occurs in wasp species that are infected with Wolbachia. And parthenogenesis is asexuality. It's when a virgin female who hasn't mated um, can, in fact, lay all offspring. And she is fertile in the presence of the bacteria. So no male and no fertilization is required. And what happens is, is this virgin female will lay all female offspring that are infected, which in turn could lay all of their female offspring in, that are infected. And so you could see that very quickly you could have a population of wasps that are totally females. And this all-female population could eventually become an all-female species that lives quite fine. Um, the final phenotype is feminization. And this is one of my favorites. And this occurs mostly in potato bugs or little roly-polies that you find under rocks. And these are actually terrestrial crustaceans rather than insects. So Wolbachia infect arthropods in general. And so this is an example of a, of a roly-poly. And when an infected mother lays offspring, the genetically male embryos will actually develop into functional and morphological females so that the male is essentially switched into a female. Now, why would Wolbachia do that? Wolbachia does this because it's going to enhance its transmission to the next generation by switching males into females, because males are a dead end, and females are the sex that pass on the bacteria. This is um, an extreme case of science fiction for humans. But for the insect world, it's a reality. And um, I like to call it the ultimate feminist weapon for the insect world, that if you happen to get a little Wolbachia symbion inside you, uh, be prepared to be turned into a female, or uh, be prepared to have a rough life as a male. <laughs> um, is there any questions on that? So there is yeah, one exactly. here I can see. Yeah, go ahead. And yeah, if you so see it, go ahead. I'll, I'll just repeat the question. Would parthenogenesis uh, be useful as a biocontrol for pest insect species? Absolutely, um, it would be. And so there are efforts where um, scientists are trying to use this microorganism to create an all-female species. Now, here's the trick. Females are usually the, the ones that will obviously lay the eggs inside hosts. Um, so if there are pests that um, um, if there's a parasitic wasp that, that parasitizes a particular pest to agriculture to humans, it would be great to create that parasitic wasp into an all-female population or species, which them to be released and go parasitize all the hosts that are pests to agriculture or human health. So there are ways that we could engineer insects to be more effective parasites um, of, the, of the pests that we want to control and get rid of. Um, good question. Hey, I don't see any other, so I will move on. But uh, if anything comes up, feel free to ask. So the, from the basic science perspective, Wolbachia is a fascinating bacteria that does um, rather dramatic changes to the sex ratios and sex determination mechanisms. There is a human element to this, a very strong one. Um, in the last five years or so, we've learned that 
Wolbachia can be associated with severe human diseases in the developing world. And this one is, is featured as river blindness. And Wolbachia can infect not only uh, uh, insects and other kinds of arthropods, but also these filarial nematodes. Um, so these filarial nematodes are infectious to dogs. They cause heartworm in dogs, which some of you may be familiar with. They also can infect humans from an insect bite. So a black fly can transmit these filarial nematodes to humans. And the result is that these nematodes can proliferate and, in fact, infect the eyeball. And this individual here shows this stromal haze that's caused by an inflammation response of the worms inside or behind the eyeball. Um, this is the second leading cause of infectious blindness in the world. Uh, 20 million people are, in fact, uh, infected with this filarial nematode that causes this disease. Um, the really interesting thing that's come from this is that Wolbachia infect these nematodes. And if you, um, if you separate the Wolbachia from the nematodes and inject a Wolbachia extract and a nematode extract into a human or into a mouse, for example, as an experiment, what scientists have found is that the inflammation response is most due to the presence of the Wolbachia and not the nematode. So it turns out that the Wolbachia symbiont inside the nematode is the main cause of the human inflammation response that leads to the stromal haze. And one very effective way that scientists are trying to eradicate this disease is to use antibiotics to cure river blindness. So on the right, there's uh, two cross sections of the filarial nematode Oncocerca volvulus, which is one of these nasty nematode species that causes river blindness. And on the upper portion is an infected nematode, and on the lower portion is an uninfected nematode that have been cured with antibiotics. And although I won't spend too much time on here, the O in that chart means ovaries. And so in the top portion, you can see that there's ni these nice ovaries, these little circular things. In the bottom portion of those cross sections, the ovaries are gone. And it turns out when you cure Wolbachia from these nematodes, you essentially sterilize them, and they can't produce any ovaries anymore. So using antibiotics might be an extremely neat way to cure this really rather devastating disease. Um, so I won't spend too much more time on that. I just wanted to show you some of the human relevance that comes out of the system that would also be quite interesting. There's no worry about using this in the classroom. Uh, we don't uh, have nematode infections, um, and uh, our focus is on the arthropods, which are non-infectious. Uh, the Wolbachia and the arthropods are non-infectious to humans. OK, so let's take a, a quiz. Um, we're going to do another stamp question. So what is the closest relative to Wolbachia? Um, Praying mantis is, of course, an insect. E. coli is bacteria. Giardia is a protist. And mitochondria is an organelle. So if everybody could just stamp what they think their answer is. Seth, while people are stamping, um, Danielle um, poses an interesting question. Um, I thought you were more likely to come up with river blindness in certain areas of the world. So the question is, is it not necessarily region specific? In fact, it is. Um, Sort of the answer to that question is that it is region specific. So filarial nematodes are vectored by uh, flies. Uh, when the flies bite you, they can transmit the nematodes. It turns out that the flies that carry the nematodes mostly occur in Africa. And I think there are some countries in South America as well. Um, it's, a, it's a black fly, not a TT fly. TT fly transmits um, other problems. So. So if a person gets Wolbachia, can they be cured completely with antibiotics? It did not appear that the person shown in the slide looked like the damage could be reversed. So for dramatic effect, we were only showing the, uh, the, the individual who was unfortunately suffering from the disease. Uh, antibiotics treatments are ongoing in the field um, in Ghana right now. And it looks like a six-week administration of antibiotics is going to be an effective way to eradicate this disease. Um, I think there's more work is being done, and a lot of this stuff just comes up on, on, on off the press uh, uh, every week now. Um, the Gates Foundation funds this work, and there's a lot of interest. The one problem we're going to have is how do you administer antibiotics to potentially millions of people who live in villages that don't have any way of or connections with uh, the developing, with the world that can provide antibiotics. So the biggest problem is how do you administer an effective treatment? And uh, that's going to require a whole other set of social issues to deal with. Yeah, and six weeks is a long time. So that's true. You'd have to administer the antibiotic 
and then make sure that they keep taking it for the duration. Um, I'm sure different protocols will be worked on in terms of the concentration of the antibiotic and how effective it is and how quickly it acts. So maybe we should move on, because I, I, I want to get to the lab series, and we're, we're running out of time. So let's keep going with this. I'm sorry I can't answer your questions. Um, sorry, Judy. So let's go back to this poll question. It looks like everybody, most people answered E. coli, but a few of you answered Giardia, and a few of you answered mitochondria. Um, this was a trick question designed to get you to answer E. coli, because E. coli are, of course, a bacteria, and Wolbachia are a bacteria. But mitochondria, as some of you may have figured out, were also bacteria that became organelles. And mitochondria are derived from alpha proteobacteria, and Wolbachia is also an alpha proteobacteria. So it turns out the right answer is mitochondria, because these two organisms ultimately evolved from the same bacterial clade. Mitochondria evolved as organelles. Wolbachia have evolved as these parasites of reproduction in insects. But who knows? Perhaps uh, 10 million years from now, Wolbachia will be a new organelle inside insects. OK, so let's go ahead and move ahead to um, the, the meat and potatoes of this, of this project. And so how do we get you involved to discover these rather fascinating uh, symbionts within insects? OK, so this is a website that I host on um, my lab website. And I'm going to try and take you there. So just bear with me for a second. OK, it looks like it's coming up OK for me. Um, and so if you, uh, if you see the top of this, it, it lists the project, Discover the Microbes Within the Wolbachia Project. If you page down, you'll see a set of insect icons and then lab one, lab two, lab three, lab four, lab five. These are areas where if you click on the insect icon, you'll be able to download a series of five labs. And below those labs are a series of three lectures that accompany the labs. This is um, where the project begins for you, because you can download all this educational material that's designed to take you through the discovery process of looking at insects in your local fauna, doing a DNA extraction, and using biotechnology to techniques to figure out if the Wolbachia symbiont is present or not. So I'll get into more detail as we go through each of these labs. I just wanted to give you a little feel for this website. OK, so let's go on to the next slide. And this slide shows um, the next step in getting involved in this project. So we host a springtime professional development workshop for high school teachers mostly at the Marine Biological Laboratory. And these are just some photos of teachers at the workshop. There's an in, a really neat insect on the right. Um, what I'd like to plug is that in April, April 11th to 13th, we're actually hosting our next MBL professional development workshop. Um, the applications are still open. Uh, January 15th is the deadline. So if you went to our website, there's a link there to download the application. And I'll show you that link again uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, just making a little plug for anybody who might be interested in, in learning about this and coming to our workshop. We select 24 teachers um, from the application process. We also run uh, in-service training, and we'll visit high schools that have a set of teachers that are interested in bringing on this project. Um, so if there's sort of enough teachers in, the, in a particular area that want to get involved, we'll come to you and train you on these labs. When it all comes together, it looks like this. So these are students from Fannie Lou Freedom Hamer High School in the Bronx, New York. These are, in fact, ninth and 10th graders. Um, their teacher, Molly Shabaka, visited our, our workshop in 2005. She went back. She applied for some um, foundation support, got a lot of money, although it's not necessarily needed, and was able to buy her classroom based on this project, thermocyclers and computers and microscopes to run this thing in her classroom. Um, we're making all of this implementation a lot easier, but it just shows you some of the first results we got from how interesting this project is and the students actually doing it. I'm going to try and use the pointer here. So this student is doing a DNA extraction of an insect. Uh, he is using a, a pestle to macerate up an insect to get its DNA out. This student here is uh, looking under the microscope and doing some insect identification. And these students here are using a machine called a thermocycler, which amplifies DNA and copies it many, many times. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. OK. 
so the first lab is to is to in fact collect insects and then bring them back to the lab and identify them. Now, if you don't have a resident entomologist around, we have to have a way to assist the discovery process of identifying insects. And we can do this at a website called Discover Life. So let me try and take you there. Okay, maybe a little slow to come up right now. I don't say yeah, uh, Michelle. So. Michelle just made a comment. They're going to use it for their Drosophila lab this year. So um, we have somebody, a, a participant who's used it already. So. Oh, wonderful! Do you use um, Do you use Discover Life or do you use the Wolbachia project? Okay, well, um, I'm actually having difficulty calling up this website, and you may not, but it's also on the screen if you are having problems. I wanted to take you through um, this website. Let's look at the screenshot for now. So on the left column, there are 31 kinds of insect orders, and this website allows you to select various features of the insects, whether they have two wings, um, whether they have broad wings. And if you just go through these questions and only answer what you can, and don't answer what you can't so you don't get anything wrong, and you were to select the search buttons on the right, that list on the left would streamline what possible insect orders that you could identify with the answers that you've provided to the website. Eventually, your class whittles down enough, questions, enough answers to the questions to get to the insect order. And that's the goal, is to bring in these insects from the field it could be whatever you want to design. It could be that you have a river and you'd like to collect insects near the river, across both sides of the river, or just ask students to bring in insects from home. This is where the ownership of the project begins and really the discovery begins. They then become identifiable with this website called Discover Life. And this website is also in Lab 1, the Insect Identification Lab, um, as you go through it. OK, I'm going to skip over. Uh, a couple of the labs, but I also at the same time wanted to give you a feel for what the labs look like when you download them. So these are labs two and three. Lab two is the DNA extraction lab, and lab three is the agarose gel electrophoresis lab. The DNA extraction lab is designed to, to crunch up the bugs, and that's often one of the fun parts of this lab series. The students get a big kick out of macerating their insects and basically creating mush. And out of that mush, uh, through this through this lab, we get some DNA. And the key is that if the insect is infected, there will be Wolbachia DNA as well as insect DNA. And if the insect is uninfected, there won't be any Wolbachia DNA in that extraction. And we will use some biotechnology techniques to visualize and amplify the DNA so that we can see if the Wolbachia DNA is, in fact, present or not. As you notice, these labs have learning goals, learning objectives, um, the time to take the time to, pr uh, to prepare for these, um, and also the national science education standards that are aligned with each of the labs. And also, we provide a list of materials, how much you'll need, uh, where you can possibly order from if necessary. And so we just try and make this as easy as possible for you, the teacher, to implement the discovery in the classroom. And again, these are all downloadable at the website. So I've mentioned a, a bit about a thermocycler and polymerase chain reaction, or PCR for short. Um, I think I've given you the answer a couple times already, but let's go ahead and take the poll question and see maybe who's paying attention. So PCR is a biotechnology method that either extracts DNA, amplifies DNA, sequences DNA, or expresses RNA from DNA. So Rob, could you uh, let us know what people are, are guessing? All right, so um, Seth, go ahead and turn your mic off just for a second there, please. And and um, while you're putting in your answers, I encourage you also, um, uh, we haven't set up for questions in a little bit, so if you have any questions while you're waiting for the results to come up, um, go ahead and type in your questions there. Um, Seth has covered a lot of interesting things, a lot of opportunities for you, for you as a teacher to participate in, but also for your students to be involved, even if it's just learning the process of how this this work happens. So um, I'm going to uh, give you just a few more minutes. It looks like most people have already answered. It looks like we've got an answer um, that um, you can't stump this, this group. 
they they know their stuff here. So let me call up the uh, poll question, and then I will hand it back over to you, Seth. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Wonderful, guys. This is uh, clearly we're on to something here, and we might not even need this seminar. So the answer is B. Uh, the PCR is a method that amplifies the DNA. And this is a technique that's universal at the college level. And part of our goal in this project is to trickle this technology down into the high school classroom, and maybe even middle schools as well. We've had some success with that. When a technique in a science becomes so universal, it moves to education. And that's kind of the phase we're in with PCR. Some of you may already have experience with this. I know a lot of people don't. Um, we provide the machine, which is called a thermocycler, directly to you so that you don't have to bear the cost of this thousand, several thousand dollar piece of equipment. So if folks want to get involved with this project and they're worried about expensive things like this biotechnology machines, we send them to you free of charge just as long as you send that back to us. We'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed that you do send it back. Um, so let's move on. I should just mention that PCR is the method that we detect Wolbachia DNA with. And so if Wolbachia DNA is present, we'll be copying it millions of times and then be able to visualize that DNA on a gel. And this is a school that just completed the project. Um, the teacher, Carolyn, in this classroom that is from Binghamton High School, and these pictures show herself on the bottom there and a couple of students doing the molecular biology techniques. Um, this took place in December 2007. And what they discovered was a number of new insect species shown on the right here um, that were infected with Wolbachia. And this is actually an example of a model agarose gel that we can see some new data on. So this particular insect is a cricket, and that cricket shows a fluorescent band that is the Wolbachia band that was copied millions of times so that we can visualize it with this fluorescence method on the gel. And this particular student found that this cricket was infected, which was entirely new. And they did this for something like 40 insects that they brought into the lab, and about 20% of them were infected, which actually matched the infection frequency that we estimated in the, um, in the description of why insects are such a great system. That is that 20% of them have Wolbachia. So it's a null hypothesis that 20% of the insect species you bring into the lab will be infected, which means one out of every five. And this is going to produce some great success for the classes and the students. We also provide negative controls. So we provide insects that we know are uninfected, and um, therefore they should produce no Wolbachia band. And so we demonstrate the utilities of having negative controls and positive controls, and then the unknown samples. This is the true discovery of looking at these unknown, for example, this cricket, and finding that at the end of the day when the students run their gel, they've got a whole bunch of new insects that are infected with Wolbachia. All right. That's a big result in and of itself that will actually get reported to the scientific community um, through connections with my lab. But it doesn't stop there. So um, we want to produce DNA sequences ultimately from the new Wolbachia DNA that's discovered in insects. And so we have a, a collaboration between high schools and my lab at the Marine Biological Laboratory, where the students will send DNA templates to the Marine Biological Laboratory We'll sequence your templates for free and then send that back to you through an online website. You could then download those sequences and do a bioinformatics lab to analyze how closely related the Wolbachia sequences that you discovered in your class are there to the rest of the database that's published by scientists. And then you can make a phylogenetic tree with those DNA sequences. And so this all happens in lab five, the DNA sequence analysis lab. And once we provide you the DNA sequence, it simply becomes a Google search for DNA sequences. This is what bioinformatics boils down to. So if you were to type in Wolbachia in Google, the matches with Wolbachia will come back first. And the, the same thing happens with DNA sequences. If you were to type a DNA sequence in there, you'd get all the best matches back with that hit that sequence. And, but we don't do that in Google. We'll do that in a website called NCBI. And this is uh, this is the web address for NCBI. And I think I might be running out a little time, so I'm not going to get us to the website. Um, but take note of the, of the website, and I'll post it in the text box. OK, there you go. So um, 
let's go to one feature of NCBI, which is called BLAST. And Lab, Fly, Lab 5 takes you through a BLAST analysis, which is the Google search of this, of this particular analysis. Um, again, I'm going to actually just post this into the, into the text box so you all can access it. Okay, so this particular web link from Geospeza may be familiar to some of you. It teaches you how to do this Google-like search in NCBI or BLAST. And it uses these features of green arrows that you can see on the screen. And it tells you sort of where to point and click to be able to do your own BLAST search. And so you can take your students through this particular uh, exercise um, with or without real sequences. So you can download any kind of sequence, or we can provide you fake Wolbachia sequences. And we do that in the lab um, to be able to do a BLAST search with or without whether you have a sequence or not. And ultimately, what you'll get back, just like a Google search, is the best hits in that Google, in that Google search to your DNA sequence. And it'll tell you, has the sequence been discovered already? And if so, what particular insect has it been discovered in? And then you might ask yourself, well, why is it in insect A, but I found it in insect B? And so all sorts of ecological and evolutionary questions could come up, um, such as, why is the same Wolbachia strain in multiple hosts? Well, what explains that? Horizontal transmission, perhaps? So there's a lot of open-ended questions that can happen through the discovery process. OK. Um, I'm being uh, emphasized to wrap it up a little bit. And so I just want to close with this website address again. And uh, let's see if we can post it in the text box. I think I can handle that. OK. There it is again. Um, and this is the point A for the project. So we can download all the labs here. You can learn more about the background information, the resources we offer. It has contact information. Importantly, you can download the application for the MBL workshop April 11th to 13th. I hope some of you might be interested enough to take a look and send it in. Feel free to get in touch with me, um, either during the chat or after, the, after we close this up. Uh, ultimately, we are creating a partnership between uh, my lab and the institution I'm at, the Marine Biological Laboratory, and you. And then that's the most important thing, to bring science to your classroom. Um, I want to thank the HHMI again, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, for sponsoring this project. We're doing this for five years. So if you can't get to it this year, uh, keep us in mind in future years um, as we go forward. And I want to thank the Marine Biological Laboratory. Um, and. We'd like to thank NSDL and NSTA, and Rob in particular, for uh, setting up such a great web seminar. And we want to thank you, most importantly, for listening, paying attention, asking great questions. And hopefully, we can keep that up um, as we do a little chat after, the, after Rob goes through a few things. <laughs>